Napoleonic era, why did so many officers move from using small swords and spadroons to sabres? Hi folks, Matt Eason here of Scholar Gladiatore. Now this is potentially a massive question, so I'm going to try and answer it in the most, I think, concise and to the point way possible. So I think that the basic context of warfare wasn't just about sword versus sword, and I'll come back to this point in greater detail in a minute. But first of all, to set some background. So in the 18th century, it was completely normal. I'll put these two swords down for a second. It was completely normal for lots of officers on foot, obviously cavalry, people on horseback are a different scenario, but people on foot, officers on foot, to be armed with small swords. Now the small sword was the gentleman's dueling sword of the period. And you have to bear in mind that officers in this age are not primarily there to fight, they're primarily there to be officers, to lead men. And the men do the fighting. The men use their firearms, they use their bayonets, sometimes they've got sidearms that are hangers, We'll come back to that as well. Um, but the officers, for the most part in the 18th century, were armed and equipped with small swords because that represented their role as gentlemen, gentry, leaders of men, leaders of the working classes who made up the majority of the soldiers on foot anyway. And um, also, we have to bear in mind that fencing at this time revolved around the use of the small sword and the foil. So foil fencing, uh, the foil is the practice weapon of the small sword. So even in the modern uh, Olympic world, the, the root of modern foil fencing, not epee and sabre, that's a different scenario, different, different story there, uh, but foil fencing comes from the practice of the small sword. So in the 18th century, really, the beginnings of the rules that we even see today and the practice weapons that we see used today have their root in the 18th century. Some people would argue it goes back to the late 17th century. In fact, I couldn't disagree with that, actually. The end of the 1600s is really where we see the birth of the small sword and what we now recognise as the small sword and foil fencing. And of course it has its roots in earlier rapier traditions, but again that's another story. So in the 18th century the small sword was the de facto um, sword that gentlemen settled matters of honour with, it was what they dueled with, it was what they practised with in the fencing cells, and it was also, for the most part, what they carried by their side on the battlefield into war. And bear in mind, again, that this is not a useless weapon in war. You can still stab people with it, you can still parry with it, you can still take on opponents who have got a variety of weapons that you might um, find on the battlefield in that day. Um, however, it's maybe not really optimised, it's not designed for that primary purpose. Its primary purpose is as a dueling sword against someone else with a small sword. Now. The battlefields of the 18th century were incredibly varied. I think a lot of people think about maybe the big sort of pitched battles in Europe or um, in some case America, the American Revolution for example, between British and American forces. But you have to bear in mind that there were many other types of battle and war going on all around the world. This is the age of colonialism, not just British colonialism, but French, Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch, um, so on and so forth. And this covered the whole globe. So in some cases, people with small swords were coming up against people with tulwars or um, various types of Filipino weapon or Native American weapons like tomahawks and spears all over Asia, so Chinese, Japanese opponents. And the small sword, for the most part, doesn't seem to have done particularly well in that type of fighting. Um, in addition to which, Remember I said I'd come back to those infantrymen. So, most of you know that in the 18th and 19th centuries, the standard infantryman's weapon was a long-barreled firearm, initially muskets, and then as we get into the uh, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, uh, sorry, end of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th century, rifles as well, but basically long-barreled firearms with a triangular socket bayonet attached. Now this is a later um, Crimean War period um, percussion lock, but ignore that, imagine it's a flintlock. Okay, so flintlocks in this period with triangular socket bayonets. And these are fairly long, fairly heavy objects. They're usually about the height of a man. They usually weigh eight or nine pounds, which is about the weight of a medieval pole axe, uh, or a, it's really heavier than most two handed swords. It's a, it's a really heavy object because it's designed to shoot ball, <laughs> shoot a musket ball um, hundreds of yards. It's not designed for, for close combat, but they did get used for that with a bayonet on the end. So this is what the standard infantryman has. But in addition to that, they also have various forms of 
hanger. Now, what is a hanger? A hanger is essentially any form of short cut and thrust sword. And here's just one example. So this type of thing is essentially a short saber. Some of them had straight blades, they had various types of felt, some of them are a bit more protective, but for the most part, because they were primarily designed to be worn at the side as a backup weapon and often used for chopping wood, incidentally, um, as they were worn as a backup weapon, you didn't want them to be particularly big or cumbersome or have big um, hand guards. And so really they were just that. And what were these for? These hangers were essentially for last ditch self-defense, perhaps storming into something like a building or a trench where there wasn't enough space to maneuver your massive musket and bayonet. And additionally, they were sometimes used as tools, sometimes for clearing uh, brushwood, clearing out branches for artillery, emplacements, stuff like this, sometimes splitting uh, splitting wood for, um, for making a campfire and that kind of stuff. They got used and abused and as a result many of them that survive today, including this one, are in pretty bad shape. Um, but, so there was a differentiation between those which were backup weapons and quite utilitarian and what the officer carried, which was his actually his primary weapon in this period. Yes, he might have pistols as well, but he didn't have to have. This was actually his primary weapon. Um, emblem and, and weapon so this is not only for self-defense but also to represent his social class and show that he is an officer as well as his more expensive uniform but uh, as we get into the 18th century when we're talking about india or the americas or you know down in south america wherever there's lots of fighting going on which means that some officers are thinking i want something that's a bit more of a practical weapon so as a result, we start seeing some officers start to carry the same types of hangers that their men were carrying. Now, the irony here is that as we get into the Napoleonic period, or as we go through the Napoleonic period, so from the 1790s through to the 1810s, we actually see at the beginning, a lot of infantry all over Europe and Americas had both a firearm with a bayonet and a hanger. However, by the end of the Napoleonic period, they, most forces had pretty much done away with those hangers. They were still being carried by some, but standard British line infantry, for example, didn't have them. They just trusted to their bayonet. But ironically, what, the, um, what a lot of the officers had started doing is carrying these, because they had to carry a sword and they wanted something that was a little bit more versatile for different types of fighting. And so they ended up carrying things like this. Commonly and often called in the modern world a flank officer's sabre, which is a completely useless and rubbish and meaningless and incorrect term, this is simply an infantry officer's sabre. This is the 1803 pattern, and in fact, these didn't just come in from 1803, they existed before that, um, and when they came to devise the 1803 pattern, they looked at pre-existing patterns and based it on those. So officers throughout the 1790s had been gradually shifting from various types of spadroon and uh, small sword. And the spadroon came in 1796 and had certainly been carried widely in the 1780s. Um, and the spadroon really, you could say, is a militarized and slightly broader version of the small sword. What I'm actually holding here is a later Victorian French epee, actually. And this is a superior officer's, a high ranking officer's um, dress sword, essentially, but you could use it as a weapon as well. So we had this period in between where we went from officers primarily carrying small swords to then carrying spadroons, which were a, a, essentially a small sword with some cutting capacity, almost like the marriage between a back sword and a small sword, to then the spadroons not being very popular and them switching to things that were more sabre-like. And eventually, um, by the end of the Napoleonic period, certainly in the British Army and the French as well, we find them carrying both the spadroons and sabres. Um, now, when we talk about these um, comparisons, we often kind of like, because it's the modern world and because it's the internet, we go, which is better? These are the pluses, the plus points of this type. These are the plus points of this type. So spadroon versus saber, which is better? But you've got to bear in mind, so this is the simple fact that if you only go away with one piece of information from this video, this is the piece of information I want you to pay attention to. On a typical battlefield, skirmish, siege, raid, patrol, whatever, engagement with the enemy in the Napoleonic period, or you could extrapolate this to the 18th century or right the way through to the middle of the 19th century, most officers are not going to be fighting other officers with swords. So comparing sabre against small sword or small sword against hanger or small sword against spadroon or spadroon versus sabre or any of these is really interesting and is really fun, 
but it's not necessarily something that would happen very often because the number of officers is very small compared to the number of men and most of the men have these. So actually, if you're an officer choosing a weapon, not just an emblem, because if you just want an emblem and something to wave and point, you may as well carry the, the lightest and fanciest looking thing, which is probably a small sword. Most officers, if they actually have to fight, are either going to be fighting, if they're European or, shall we say, westernised, mechanised opponents with a firearm with a bayonet on the end. Now, if you're fighting those opponents, then something a little bit beefier and heavier is probably a good idea. And so therefore something like a sabre is easier to defend yourself against bayonets with than a small sword is. I mean, honestly, try, a small sword's fine against a sabre, but trying to use a small sword against a bayonet that, uh, with, attached to a firearm that weighs eight or nine pounds against something that only weighs 400 grams, Difficult, very, very difficult, um, and you can only poke them, you can only thrust them as well. At least with against this, not only have you now got a more robust weapon that's able to parry a bit more solidly, you've also got the options to cut or thrust as you like to all different locations, but because you can cut, you can target the opponent's hands holding the musket and bayonet. So in a European theatre, I would argue, the sabre and the hanger are far better weapons against the musket and bayonet than a small sword is. And they're better than a spadroon is as well, I would argue. Number one. But remember that, again, this is the age of, of colonialism and colonial warfare. So if you're fighting Native Americans using tomahawks, if you're fighting Indians in India fighting to using tolwars and shields, or in China or wherever you might be, against those sorts of opponents, the problem with the small sword is it's quite easy to get overwhelmed, okay? So yes, indeed, you might be able to thrust someone through the chest or face and that might kill them sometime later after they've buried a tolwa or a tomahawk in your head. Whereas the sabre, for example, is not only able to give more strong and robust parries against these type of less mechanized opponent's weapons, shall we say, so, you know, heavier and more powerful axes and swords, not only is it able to defend better against them, but I would argue that the cuts that you're able to give and keep motion, and remember cuts don't get stuck in a body in the same way that thrusts do, are more able to deal with these types of opponents. So, my concluding thought is that if we're going small sword or spadroon versus sabre, they're kind of an even fight, I think. You've got the reach advantage and the nimbleness of the point um, with the spadroon or the um, small sword. And I think that the small sword can easily hold its own against the sabre. In fact, we do this in sparring and I would say it does. They're pretty much equal uh, weapons. They've each just got different advantages to each other. However, on a battlefield or raiding military use in general, I think that the sabre or weapons like it, like the hanger or the backsword, are more versatile and practical weapons for warfare as an actual weapon, not as an emblem, but as a weapon, than the small sword and the spadruna. And I think that that's why overall militaries all over the world had switched uh, by the middle of the 19th century, almost entirely, with a few exceptions, to using sabres instead of using things like this, unless you happened to be a superior officer who was not expecting to ever get into combat and you had lots of people in front of you to protect you. I hope that's been somewhat interesting and thought provoking. If you massively disagree, that's fine. Post in the comments below and explain your reasons why. Any other questions, comments, requests for future videos, all welcome below. I have been Matt Easton, I will continue to be, and I will see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.